las golondrinas porque me voy lejos muy lejos hace tiempo lo que más quiero se fue muy lejos se fue de aquí Que me toquen las golondrinas, que sus notas lleguen a mi alma, a esa tierra linda y lejana que me ha robado. A mi querer Por amor de Dios Les pido Buen amigo cantinero Para las otras yo coopero Ya no me hagas Esperar, toquenme las golondrinas, porque pienso alejarme. Solo quiero que recuerden mis tristezas. Cariño mío, corazón de otra. ¡Ajá! Y tú que le banca rosa, sí señor. Adiós, adiós, adiós. Solo 
Solo quiero que recuerden mis tristezas y mi dolor. Cariño mío, corazón de otra. Y tú que le banca rosa, sí señor. Adiós, adiós Adiós Good morning everyone uh, This is Hudi Pega from the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. Thank you for um, thank you for joining us this morning and welcome. Uh, we wanted to show that video again from the, uh, around the Alasana Pachi Courts from, that we used last week because we want to connect today's um, conversation to our ongoing conversation in the community about redevelopment and threats to, to displacement on the west side of San Antonio. Uh, today, we are going to be joined by a panel of folks here in San Antonio, uh, folks in Houston, and also um, in New York. And we're gonna talk about the, um, the idea, we're gonna talk about community benefits agreements and how this is a tool to kind of not stop development and displacement, but it's a tool to kind of level the playing field between development and low-income neighborhoods and communities of color. Um, oftentimes with redevelopment and expansion projects, uh, the community is left out of negotiation and the repercussions to the community are usually not, uh, not seen in it or discussed in any of the planning of the development. And so CBAs are a tool that we would like to use here in San Antonio. We started this conversation in San Antonio around CBAs because of UTS, our concern um, amongst many community advocates on the West Side around the repercussions that would happen for the West Side, the historic West Side neighborhood uh, with UTSA expansion and redevelopment. UTSA has a, the University of Texas San Antonio has a plan to expand and build a $90 million school of data science at $161 million in a Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And we know that this can have effects on us um, as a community. So before I go ahead, um, we, we wanna go ahead and introduce everyone. Um, if we can have our panelists introduce themselves, please. Hello, my name is Leosa Elegon. Uh, I am from the Houston, Texas, uh, Southwest area. I'm an organizer for the Houston Coalition for Equitable Development Without Displacement. And I'm really excited um, to talk to folks over in San Antonio about the things that we're doing over here in regards to community benefits agreements um, alongside um, Mary Claire Neal. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to Mary Claire. Hi everyone, my name is Mary Claire Neal and I'm both a Rice University student and an organizer with Houston Coalition for Equitable Development Without Displacement. And I'm really excited to be here um, and thanks for inviting me. Um, next up, yeah, Jerry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Jerry Gonzalez. I'm Associate Professor of Chicano History at UTSA. Uh, the director of the UTS in Mexico Center. Um, my uh, my role on this on this uh, committee began probably in August September um, when Hudi invited me to be part of the discussions around um, the history of, of San Antonio community building coalitions um, activism and my my areas of research in uh, Latino metropolitan histories. Um, were, were part of that discussion. So I've been really um, uh, honored to be a part of this committee and looking forward to this conversation with the community. And I'll pass it on to Sofia. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be with you. My name is Sofia Lopez. I use she, her pronouns. And I am a, I do housing justice work here in San Antonio. Um, for my professional work, I also look at the ways in which the biggest 
um, landlords in the country and Wall Street have a monopoly on our housing and they use that monopoly to hurt communities of color most. So happy to be here, happy to talk about extractive development um, and who's responsible locally. And I'll pass it on to Adriana. Hi, buenos dias a todos. My name is Adriana Bundis and I'm a Chicana educator. I have the honor of learning and teaching with students at Lanier High School on the west side of San Antonio, a community directly impacted by the potential of this community benefits agreement, a community definitely impacted by this expansion. I'm familiar with UTSA as a recent graduate, and I'm a proud member of our union district, our district union that reminds me in these conversations to center the people who are directly impacted by those life altering decisions and to center and to advocate for our youth. Um, I wanna welcome everyone for joining us and just share appreciation for making the decision to be a part of this big step moving forward. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ted DeBarbieri. I'm a law professor at Albany Law School, which is an independent law school in the capital of New York State. And I also direct a community economic development clinic where we represent community groups uh, advocating for equitable development in our area um, and broadly across our state. I also write about community benefits agreements and uh, have represented community coalitions in negotiating community benefits agreements in uh, primarily in New York City. I'm very excited to be here to talk about what's going on in San Antonio and Houston. Thank you and thank you again for joining us. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start with our questions for our panelists. And if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat and Facebook and we will answer them at the end. Um, our first question is, why are, what are CBAs and how do they benefit the community? Um, are there examples where they were successful and who engages in CBAs and why? Great. Um, th thanks. Th thanks, Udi. So I'm. I'm just. I have a couple slides that I'm going to share uh, very briefly. I know there's a ton of uh, knowledge and information uh, in the uh, among the panelists. Um, so I will just uh, sort of launch in here. The, the first the first thing that I want to suggest is that um, it's incredibly important to work with a local lawyer in your area in negotiating a community benefit agreement. So whether it's with UTSA uh, or with Rice, it's incredibly important to work with not just a local attorney who understands equitable development, but someone who understands community benefits agreements in particular. Um, I'm not admitted in Texas. I'm just here sharing what I know and sharing the information and research that I've done. Um, you know, to the, the, the question here on this slide, you know, why should community uh, groups and organizers care about CBAs? Well, community benefits agreements are one way for to um, get involved in the land use approval process uh, for communities, which often can get shut out of that process, especially low income communities, especially in communities of color. Um, so, you know, allow organizers to directly uh, get involved in the process outside of formal legal procedures. Uh, we've talked a, a little bit about the definition. Um, as, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll run through that very briefly. This is a picture of the Staples Center in Los Angeles, which is one of the first community benefits agreements in California, um, the binding uh, contract. But uh, so, um, sorry, this is a picture from Columbia University in New York. Uh, Columbia had a, a CBA effort that I think in many respects um, uh, failed because the, the coalition negotiating the CBA was not inclusive of uh, uh, the community groups that were advocating for uh, the benefits to actually reach the um, uh, residents who needed the, uh, the, the benefits most. Um, Barclays Center in Brooklyn had a uh, agreement, but uh, failed in a lot of ways uh, because the, the coalition that entered into the agreement was not broad and representative of the diverse interests in the community. Um, rather, in, in the Columbia example and in the Barclays Center example, both coalitions were created largely to enter into the agreement and, and didn't necessarily represent the grassroots organizing that had gone in. Just, just very direct and to answer the question that Houdit asked, um, 
you know, CBA is our private contract. So we're, we're talking about contract law here between a developer and a, a coalition that's inclusive of community groups in, in an area. It's not an agreement between government officials and the developer. Those are very important. Uh, development agreements are very important, but not necessarily uh, CBA. They're, they're a different thing. Uh, terms that can be included in CBAs are as diverse as you can imagine. Um, things like local hiring programs, living wages, uh, funding for job training, uh, re requiring certain set-asides for subcontracting in terms of working with minority and women-owned businesses or MWBEs. Um, community groups have, ton have, have significant leverage in terms of um, uh, sort of media campaigns, organizing efforts. And you know, I, 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 you all are the experts and many of the people who are attending the Facebook Live today know much more about this, this organizing work um, that you've been doing over a long time. Um, the threat of litigation is also a point of leverage that community groups do have to this. So what determines whether a CBA can be enforced? I know enforcement is a big issue. There's this uh, sort of, there's this term called consideration basically means that both sides have to give something up. So typically developers are gonna give tangible economic develop, um, ta tangible economic benefits. Community coalition and exchange will agree to either uh, support a project or at least not oppose it. So as long as both sides ha give something up, then they can be enforced. Alternatives to a, a CBA is to try to stop the development. And there's different ways to do that depending on your local land use uh, tools. Um, I'll say a couple of words about the, the uh, Kingsbridge Armory uh, Community Benefit Agreement that I worked on with some individuals at Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition. They have the, the Kingsbridge Armory Redevelopment Alliance that I borrowed a, a picture from here. Um, I have a, a, a case study that's available on um, elsewhere that I'll, I'll just share um, here. Um, if, if people on the, on the Facebook Live want to check it out, you can do a search for, let's see, it's uh, Kingsbridge Armory case study is available on something called Social Science Research Network or SSRN. I'll put a link on the Facebook Live. Uh, but essentially, but just in a, in a, in a, in a nutshell, the uh, diverse coalition of the Kingsbridge Ar Armory Redevelopment Alliance was able to win significant contributions in terms of uh, dollars from a developer that was building a large, um, the, the largest ice sports uh, arena in the world. Um, essentially 8 million to build out a community, 52,000 square feet of, of community space, a um, million dollars a year of uh, uh, you know, cash for nonprofit programming, as well as to share revenue from ice rink sales, in addition to local hiring, uh, local procurement, uh, green, uh, 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 green benefits, in addition to technical uh, assistance, and even new, new school construction. So I'm going to... Um, uh, so, yeah, just wanted wanted to share a little bit from that experience related to what what some CBAs um, have been able to achieve. Um, the and this is just some info about me. If if people want to reach out or um, or, or or chat uh, after, um, this is how you can find me. And I'm also on um, I'll I'll chat on on Facebook Live. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Ted. Um, I guess our next question is, uh, what has been the effect historically of development on displacement in inner cities across the United States on poor people and communities of color? Um, Jerry. Thank you, Huli. That's, um, that's a huge question, and I'll, I'll do my <laughs> best to do justice to it in, in the short amount of time that I have. Um, uh, I want to begin by by just acknowledging uh, the beauty of that opening today to the Facebook Live um, that that outlined the history of the Alasan and um, and the efforts to preserve it, uh, I, I think that that history is really what drives the efforts that are are undertaken today with this conversation around the community benefits agreement, right? And one of the things that's all that's that's really excited me about this uh, this work is how how much history is part of the discussion and how much it drives the need for um, a more equitable and just future. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to pick up on, on some of the points that the opening made, um, you know, the, the, the 1930s we associate um, really with the deep 
economic crisis. Uh, but we associate, um, you know, urban historians uh, recognize that in the 1930s, there was an effort by uh, local politicians um, all the way up through the federal government to um, ameliorate what they saw as, um, as blights on the body politic of urban America. And so they created um, studies around particular communities, mostly around poor communities of color, uh, with the intention of, um, of either removing them or improving them in some way. Uh, the efforts, the end results usually were displacement, but, um, but out of that uh, early um, effort by the federal government to, um, to uh, uh, improve, so to speak, uh, urban America, uh, grew this idea of housing, of public housing, I should say. And so you know, obviously the Alessandro Apache courts it became part of that, uh, was a result of, of those early discussions. Um, but that conversation really uh, was was curtailed around the time that World War II um, uh, set set upon us, and then picked up again following World War II. Uh, the the efforts by the federal government to um, expand the role of the of the federal government in people's daily lives and to uh, to meet the needs of a struggling and vulnerable uh, population uh, were were. Uh, evident throughout the New Deal policies, right? Um, the, you know, some of them were key ones like the Homeowners Loan Corporation in the 1930s, um, the Federal Housing Administration's founding. These were efforts by the government to, to really uh, tackle housing problems, right? And even though they were mostly aimed at um, middle income white folks, uh, some of the effects uh, negatively and positively would, would take place in uh, urban communities of color. Uh, 1949, I think, is a really important date for, for folks to consider even in this discussion because it, it launched two really key um, federal provisions that uh, we're still dealing with the consequences today. Um, one was expanding public housing and the other was urban renewal. Right, and so, so the federal government puts its full weight behind this effort to, um, to invest in the economic development of urban places, right? And so I have a, a few statistics here for folks. Um, I know statistics are fun. Um, <clears throat> so just, just, just to give you context of what this effort did, by the 1990s, the federal government had launched more than 2,500 urban renewal projects. Right, uh, across about a thousand American cities. In the 1950s and 60s, when the height of urban renewal uh, was at its, urban renewal was at its peak in terms of use, 20% uh, of central city housing for African Americans and Latinos had been destroyed. 20%. 90% um, of low-income housing was never replaced, which mean, meant that there was a, um, a crowding out, so to speak, of poor people of color from places that they had previously lived. And so where did they go? Um, folks uh, moved into um, uh, different areas throughout the city, um, sometimes even outside of the city, uh, and in ways that uh, suburbanized um, previously urban poverty, right? And so what happened was that the paltry uh, resources for the urban poor that were generally concentrated downtown became even further geographically separated from um, an increasingly suburban uh, poor communities of color. Um, <clears throat> so this, you know, we see this really pick up pace by the 1980s, right? Uh, you know, we have uh, these, these massive displacements as a result of urban renewal, <clears throat> um, a coupled with a lack of, um, of actual investment in these communities for the improvement of those particular communities, right? Uh, so what begins to happen is that communities invest in themselves, either through organizing, through, through the arts, um, through uh, community education, and um, and the 
the flavor and the character that folks begin to create in these neighborhoods and the barrios and the hoods throughout America um, eventually become the very kinds of commodified um, aesthetics that make them ripe for gentrification, right? And so the communities that, that gave rise to these authentic communities are, are you know, by the end of the 20th century, being displaced by um, what are more uh, private market actors uh, moving into these communities and then furthering or continuing to push out communities of color. So by the, by the turn of the century, we're beginning to look at an increasingly um, suburban uh, poor. And, you know, now, I mean, we kind of see um, some of the consequences of that, uh, just to, you know, what would, would have been mundane daily commutes are now becoming potentially lethal uh, with the pandemic, as more and more people are having to rely on public transportation to move in, etc. So, um, you know, so that's, uh, you know, a very, very quick history of, um, of, some, of, of some of these, these dynamics and these factors. There's plenty more to talk about, I'm sure, in the Q&A. Um, but I just wanted to pose a couple of questions, right? How do we build on this history to think about what equitable futures look like for, um, for communities like the West Side, right? And, you know, um, now that we're in a, in a particular period of time where uh, we think equitably, uh, how are investments going to benefit the communities that actually live there without resulting in displacement, the kind of displacement that we've seen historically. So I think that's that's the goal, that's the effort behind um, what we're doing here, not just today, but in, in I think in, in the long run. Um, and it's an important community conversation that is gonna involve a number of different actors. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing how this goes. Thanks, Hudi. Yes, um, would anybody like to add to that? Yeah, I would love to add to that. Thank you. And thank you for historicizing our, our current struggle and, and, and triumphs, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, I think historically, when our communities become gentrified, our schools in working class communities become gentrified. And currently, our own Spanish language is being gentrified with the proliferation of white center dual language programs, which were created initially to support the full linguistic repertoires of, of our people, of the people in the most, dis, uh, and the people who have been minoritized. When the signs and the names of our very own streets are written in Spanish, yet we demean the language in efforts to elevate English in our classrooms, we are taking part in that gentrification and continuing a violent history of marginalization for our students and our youth. When we displace students from their homes, from their campuses, from their stories, they begin to lose their identity, their stability, their strength, and their truth. So when we invite gentrification without community voice, without affording opportunities to our students, because they have history has shown us that they have risen to the occasion, most definitely. We take a dangerous role in disenfranchising our own communities. So thank you for historicizing. And I wanna make sure that we, uh, we elevate the role of, of our education system in our schools. Because when kids get displaced, that means they move further and further away from their home campuses. Campuses that are deeply rooted in their identity and their communities. Yes, most definitely Adriana. Thank you for, for bringing that home because I think it's hard for us sometimes to relate the issues around housing and gentrification and development to our education system, especially for K through 12. Um, I know that definitely resonates for me as a mom who's from the inner city, who has my kids in inner city schools, um, we see that on the daily. And it's something, it's a connection that needs to be made uh, more it, you know, explicitly and more often in these conversations. Um, and thank you again, Jerry, for setting that historical, um, you know, context, because I think it's really important. It's another thing that we often forget. Um, you know, many of our elders continue to tell us you know, you don't, you, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you came from. So we have to be rooted in that, rooted in our culture and in our history in order to move forward in these, uh, to kind of give us strength to move forward in these difficult ways. So I just kind of want to bring it up to 
what's happening now in San Antonio and in Houston and in kind of major cities across the this, across the United States. Um, you know, affordable housing is an ongoing issue and concern and um, kind of leads us into our next question. How do tools created to build affordable housing actually benefit large scale developers instead of actually solving the housing crisis? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm happy to pick up this thread, I think, very appropriately from the historical context that we just got. And Adriana's really powerful comments about um, displacement. To me, I, I think um, a lot of the things that Jerry was talking about are all by design, right? It's incredibly profitable to move people, and, and the things that Adriana was talking about, it's incredibly profitable to move people of color out of what's considered high value property and communities of color often considered in the way. To me, this I, my background is in city planning. So this is one of the core ideologies of community development that really I think is um, doubling down on a lot of the racist legacies of how we've approached housing and how we've approached development. But I think it takes a completely different form today. It's, it's much more sanitized. Um, I, I have a couple of slides actually that I want to help guide us through my response to this question. Um, thank you for the support in helping me show these. So this title is actually borrowed from a training that I do that's a bit longer than the time I have to speak with y'all today. I recognize people might have questions. Feel free to drop them in the chat as I'm going. And um, I'm also going to drop my contact info so people can follow up with me. But this title gets the fact that what our city ends up doing again and again and again, and again is giving away the goods to the rich, right? Um, and helping promote a vision of development that creates these islands of wealth and, and doesn't really give a crap about the rest of us. Um, so I'm here to talk about action. I, I'll just, I'll say that. And I want to kind of foreground, I can't see all the people on this call, but I know in my core that the people who are on today have deep expertise, right? And that, and we're constantly told we don't understand how these things work. We're not smart enough. We don't pay enough attention. There are all of these lawyers who are driving conversations about development. Developers actually know more than we do. And I just want to say that that's, that's complete crap, right? All of us live in communities. We've all gone to schools. We all have neighbors that we talk to. We are actually so much smarter than I think most people give us credit for, particularly our decision makers. So to me, it's just very important to say that. Um, I am talking about a very specific development scheme, right? And this plays out in millions of different ways in communities all across the country, like Houdit was saying. I just want to peel back some of the layers and shine a light on it. And I actually think it's super appropriate that we have friends and comrades from Houston, because this is actually something that was created here in the state of Texas. San Antonio has made it um, a really popular way of getting housing developed here, but Houston, Dallas, and Austin are right behind us. Um, and I'll just also add, you know, given, given the context and the intention, given the context that Jerry provided and what I'm saying is all of the intentionality and profitability behind it, I am also here to be a slight voice saying that I think CBAs are, are important tools within a violent and oppressive system that ultimately needs to be upended and reimagined for our collective liberation. So that, that is where I am coming from with all of this. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I'll start to break down this specific tool. So a lot of words, again, I'm gonna to try to make this as, it, it, it's not actually that hard to understand, but it, it takes a little bit of, of walking through. So at the state, and, and actually, I just want to also say all of these things are made very intentionally confusing to keep us out, right? So that the lawyers, so that the developers can do what they do and make all of the money they can while the rest of us are struggling to understand what it is they're doing and why, are just, why, are, why the problems never get any better. So at the state of Texas, this thing called Public Facility Corporations was created. And I think it was in 2015, this law was modified very slightly. Um, but the, the core of how it works is a nonprofit that's dedicated to housing like the San Antonio Housing Trust or the San Antonio Housing Authority, and I'm happy to talk more about them for anyone who has questions, they can create these things called PFCs. 
And what happens is developers will approach these PFCs and they'll say, hey, I just bought this piece of land and I'm really interested in developing it. If we work together, I'll give you a little bit of money and you'll give me a 100% tax break on the property forever, as long as I keep this affordability in place. And I'll also get a massive sales tax on the actual construction of the property. So it's actually a pretty good deal. And the way that they pitch it is your city needs affordable housing, right? Everyone's telling you constantly that this is the problem. So I can help you, I can help you with this. But all of us know better, right? All of us know that there's no such thing as like, a developer saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to scratch your back, you scratch mine. We're going to build this affordable housing and the problem's going to go away. This has been in place for years. We still have a crisis. It's only gotten worse. So let's, let's jump to the next slide. Um, and this one's about how PFCs work. So the mayor actually is the one who appoints the board members of these PFCs, both at the housing trust and the, the housing authority. I already talked a little bit about how the developer approaches the, the person who owns the property or the, or the PFC. Um, and I just think the last bullet point here, it's important to know these deals never, ever, ever go to the city council. So there's no, there might be a zoning change, but otherwise there's no public scrutiny behind this 100% property tax waiver. And they never go to the school district. To me, this is super important because the way that our schools, the way that our local governments are funded is 100% percent through property taxes and sales tax, but mostly property tax. So what ends up happening when these deals go through is the school board doesn't get to make a choice about it. The city doesn't get to make a choice about it. The hospital doesn't get to make a choice. It's just between the developer and in this case, people appointed by the mayor. And we'll take a look at who those people are on the next slide. Again, I'm going super fast, but hang with me and I'm down to answer any questions that people might have. Um, so who makes the decisions, right? I want to shine a really bright spotlight on the San Antonio Housing Trust Public Facility Corporation because we actually know these people. It's District 1 Councilman Roberto Fermino, District 3 Councilperson and the Chair of the Board, Rebecca Villagran, District 4 Councilperson Adriana Rocha Garcia, District 5 Councilperson Shirley Gonzalez, and District 9 Councilperson John Courage. And then on the side of the Saha uh, Board, that's seven people that the mayor appointed. So the mayor actually decides who these five council people are who make these decisions. And the mayor also decides who the seven people are on the Saha board that evaluate yay or nay, whether or not they wanna take these deals on. And I will tell you, the answer is always yes. Um, I wanted to highlight also who some of the developers are who take advantage of this. So I just, I, I mapped out a couple of them in this middle column to show that actually this company out of Cleveland, Ohio, called the NRP group has by and large benefited more, more than anybody else from this, this particular scheme. This is just looking at developments here in San Antonio. The numbers are a bit bigger if you look at um, some of the other cities that I mentioned. To me, NRP is super important, right? I mentioned they're, they're based in Cleveland. They're actually the seventh biggest development company in the country, right? So here we are giving millions of dollars away at a time to a massive, massive, massive developer who, if we're being honest, doesn't actually need our money. And I'll get into what it is exactly that we're getting for our money in just a minute. Um, one other little note I have down there is a prospective developer, Weston Urban, who people involved with UTSA know all about, right? Graham Weston made this huge multi-million dollar contribution to the UTSA expansion that's happening near downtown. But he also happens to, his real estate development company also happens to own quite a bit of property in that area, in the near downtown around UTSA. So it's, to me, it's important to consider, yes, it's a charitable contribution, but also what is it that he's getting on the other side of it? And, and he's also, I think, important to note, one of the richest people in our community. This, this man is a billionaire. So for me, again, when we're taking money away from our school districts, who, who is it that we're giving that money to? Um, so I talk a bit also about our community losses. Who loses out? Renters and property taxpayers. This affects renters too. It's not just people who have a property tax bill on a home that they own. If you pay rent, I trust you, you pay more in property taxes than the people who develop these properties. And we'll, we'll break that down a little bit in just a second. It's also public school students, teachers, and the support personnel that people like Adriana's uh, teachers union represent. You guys have to deal with a lack of diminished resources because 
these developers want to create, construct, and, and operate these developments. Again, all in the name of affordable housing, but we'll peel back the, the curtain on that a little bit. Our, our public budgets also take a hit. We have less money to work with, especially now in a moment where we know that serious budget cuts are coming because of the COVID-19 crisis. I think it's a time to really evaluate whether or not this is the way that we want to go about building affordable housing. And then also people who are actually looking for a place to live. Again, they tell us that this is to alleviate our crisis, but what it is that we're getting for, for our money in these particular deals, that's not helping the people who actually need it the most. So let's, let's jump down one more. Thank you. So this is comparing what it is they're saying that we're getting versus what we're actually getting. Um, so the truth is we've overbuilt for the people who are earning the incomes that these properties deliver apartments for. And I have another slide a little bit further down. This is where things get too wonky in the housing world. Personally, I think um, there is this categorization that people use called area median income. That's based on our city plus New Braunfels and some of the other communities around us. And it basically take, it takes the average of what it is that people earn and it bases how much people should pay for housing based on that average cost, right? So we're talking about public housing, for example. Most of the people living in public housing earn way, way, way below the average, the area median income. They're actually in the 30% and below, and actually I think it's closer to 20 or 10% and below of area median income. And if you know people earn what they earn, that doesn't say anything about the people themselves. We need to house everybody, right? What we're getting for these particular developments is for people earning 80% of the area median income. So if you slice everybody in half that, and we take 100% of area median income and below, that's half of the city, right? This is like just, just a nudge to the side of that. And honestly, that's, that's like a middle income person. So this builds middle income housing and it builds luxury housing, half and half in, the, in one development. And that's what we're getting in exchange for these 100% property tax breaks. I love the quote at the bottom of this slide because a lot of this information is pulled from a study that was done at UT Law School. And the author of that report says, even in the state's most populated counties, there's a surplus of units for middle income renters and only a very small fraction of these renters are extremely cost burdened. That means they're not paying massive, massive, massive amounts of their income for rent each month. And it gets to Adriana's point, right? That like, and, and some of what I was saying earlier in the story that Jerry painted for us, that we create these downtowns that are full of wealth and that are um, created to be these glistening jewels of the people we want and not the people we have. So to me, this development scheme is, it's just another way of painting gentrification and saying, we'd much rather have a higher income population in this community. This is who it is that we're building for and not actually the people who live in this city who we know are desperate for housing. Um, and then just to explain this chart really quickly to the side, we're told that these PFCs, so the, the Saha board and the housing trust board made up of those council people tell us, well, it's okay because we're actually making a little bit of money in the process. So if we give them their tax break, that's fine. We're actually coming out with, with affordable housing, which we've just established is not actually the case. And a little bit of, of, of a pocket change for us to spend as a city or as a San Antonio housing authority. If you look at this chart, you see the total tax exemption per property versus the amount of money those PFCs are getting. Of course, the one in blue is what the developers are getting and the one in yellow is what the PFCs say that they're, they're earning back. That's a pretty skewed picture, right? To me, there's no question. We need to, to reevaluate exactly how these things are going down. So if we could go just one more, I'll talk a little bit about the impact to the schools. Thank you. So just to walk through really quickly here because I actually served on the Saha board up until this last summer. I had to vote on these deals. Clearly I was pretty against them, right? Uh, but the thing that I was told again and again and again is we're not hurting the schools. If we were hurting the schools, we wouldn't do it. The report that came out of the UT Law School shows very, very clearly, as you see in this graphic, we're absolutely hurting the schools. There's both the direct impact and the indirect impact. I'm not gonna get into all of the complicated ways in which schools are funded. We know that there's a racist history there. We know that it's totally inequitable. 
Um, and this is just building on those inequities in very serious ways, because as I say in one of the bullet points here, the wealthiest people in our communities who actually have money to spend on developing these big multifamily properties aren't actually paying their fair share, right? It's coming down, like I was saying before, on renters and homeowners to actually make up the difference. So I appreciated um, in conversation with our, our friends at the teachers union talking about things like the need to pay for hotspots, the need to pay for PPE during COVID. You know, our schools we know aren't getting the resources they need, but this is just magnified a million times during COVID when there are all of these additional expenses to actually keep people safe. So I'll, I'll just leave these numbers here for people to take a look at. $4.2 million per property lost over 20 years, 6.6 .6 million total a year for the properties that are anticipated to come online between now and 2026. We're creating a massive hole for ourselves that ultimately isn't sustainable. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And I just want to be super clear. If I haven't said, if I haven't made it clear enough already, this is hurting all of us, right? So here's another graphic. It's based on 12 projects, but the expectation is there are actually going to be three times as many of these developments by 2026, five years from now, based on the current rate of growth. And this is totally picking up steam. Developers are catching wind. They're getting really excited about it and they want to jump on board. So, um, so we're creating a, a pretty big problem if we don't stop something like this. And I just want to be clear, like there's, there's no way that taking money away from schools, that taking money away from our public budgets, our hospital, public budgets, including the city and the county, that's a violent thing to do, right? That like, that is not how we should be funding housing at all. Instead, we need to be having conversations about the kind of housing that we need, the kind of schools that we need, and then figure out how it is we go about paying for those things. Instead, we're using tools that were created by developers to meet their needs first at the expense of the rest of us. Um, and I think it's also super important to note, so a friend and I actually wrote an op-ed about this in late December, and we called out very specifically that in 2018, 35% of all San Antonio households made less than $35,000 a year. Of those families earning less than $35,000 a year, 73% were Black or Latinx, right? So this is all obviously super racialized. Um, I have a friend who's helping me do a little bit of research just to show when we build all this housing for people earning 80% of area median income, let's talk about race and let's figure out who it is that we're actually building those units for. I think the, the answer I am expecting is going to be pretty predictable and pretty clear, and it's not going to be for people of color. It's not really going to be for the poorest people. I mean, it's obviously not for the poorest people in our community. Um, so this slide just breaks down a little bit more the loss of money on the, the graphic at the right and also just makes very clear that there are only 69, not even 70 of, of over 3,000 units, almost 3,500 units that have been built that are for families earning between this $30,000 and $39,000 per year income category. And also just important to flag that most of these are also studio apartments. There's so little oversight or regulation about this. Again, developers just came in, they said that they were gonna solve our crisis for us. The people that we elect to protect us, to serve our interests said, okay, sounds good to me. Let's go ahead and do it without actually talking to us about the things that we want and need first. So symptomatic of, of how our, our whole system is fundamentally, and it's maybe not legally corrupt, but in practice, super corrupt and doesn't actually serve our interests. So let's go through the next three slides pretty quickly. So just an image really quickly. This is just one example. It's called the Baldwin apartment complex in downtown, just to the east of downtown, actually. Again, historically black part of San Antonio. So next slide. This is their property tax bill. I am sure that this is really tiny and impossible for most people to read, but it says that their property is worth 37,000, I'm sorry, my bad. $37 million, 549,410. That's, that's the appraised value for this property. And then you see that little red circle there and it goes through all of the different taxing entities, Bear County Road and Flood, the River Authority, Alamo Colleges, University Health, Bear County, City of San Antonio, San Antonio ISD, the appraisal district, 
and the estimated tax, zero, 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 all the way down. They pay absolutely nothing. There's actually an estimate for what they would pay if they weren't getting this exemption. And it's 1,000, I'm sorry, again, $1,053,498. So let's go to the next one. This is actually one of my friend's homes. Her home is worth $162,000. She is over 65. It says that her taxes without exemption would be 4,547. Because she has the over 65 set of exemptions, her taxes have been frozen for a while. She pays $648 each year. Just imagine that, a 30, over $37 million property compared to my friends, 162,000, she gets exemptions that, that she is entitled to because she's, she's over 65. And she pays more in property taxes than this massive seventh biggest builder in the country pays. To me, that's totally mind boggling. It, it makes me really mad. I would like all of you to visualize what you pay in property taxes, whether that's through your rent, whether that's through your property tax bill. Um, and just the last piece that I have is drop, I, this is a ton, and this is on the next slide. Um, drop all of your questions in the chat for me. It's a ton of information. If you're interested in taking action, I would love to hear from you. I love interactive. Uh, I guess not everyone is on the chat, but I would love to see drop like a one to five. One, if you're like, oh, I don't really get it. Five, if you're like, this makes me really angry and I want to get involved because I, I want to know who wants to get super involved. And then there's also an email address where you can get in touch with me and we can figure out where we go from here and how we build the power to make our cities work for us, not for these massive developers. So appreciate everyone's time. I know I ran through a ton of info and probably ran over time, but to, thanks thanks so much for letting me speak with y'all today. Uh, thank you so much, Sophia, for sharing all of that. And everyone, please, if you would like to get involved, please let us know in the Facebook chat or if you'd like to follow up with us um, and Sophia as well. Uh, so just moving on, uh, we wanted to kind of bring it back to the issue with UTSA and Rice and ask a question about what should the role and responsibilities of educational institutions, so that's also K through 12, and also universities and colleges, um, be towards the neighborhoods and communities and where they're located, and who decides what gets to happen. So if maybe our folks from Houston can share with us what they've been doing. Hey y'all, this is Uyosa again. And I, uh, before I even go into some of the work uh, that's being done in Houston, I want to make sure that be three things that you understand uh, by the end of this entire uh, panel discussion, right? One is that UTSA is a public uh, institution. And I say that very specifically because uh, I'm taking this energy from Imani Perry. She, she noted not too long ago that um, educational, like in, we talk about organizations and institutions, and I think, you know, plenty even like leftists or progressives or anyone that you can say, we talk about these organizations uh, as nebulous things, right, uh, that, that are very shadowy big bodies that do things, but organizations are full of people, right, and people have certain practices that they involve themselves in, right, so we're talking about whether or not UTSA, the public institution that is full of people who uh, operate off of your tax dollars are going to be operating through practices of equality or practice of practices of inequality right that's what we're talking about here so that's number one utsa is a public institution that operates largely off of your tax dollars um, and because of that uh, no university president no uh, faculty no um, politician can supersede your own uh, active involvement in this development, right? Number two, they're trying to use your money to build a thing in your space, right? They're trying to build a thing that's gonna be in your space. So that's something to really, uh, to really internalize, right? This is not a thing that's gonna, you know, build something that you're not gonna have the ability to touch or walk by or sit in, right? This is a thing that is immediately direct, directly involving you um, in addition to right talking about property taxes in addition to talking about overall gentrification. This is gonna be in your face, right? Really quickly. Number three is you have, because of all of these things, you have every, every single right to influence all of the outcomes of this development. 
start all the way at the top in regards to the programmatic things that are going to be taking place in the building to perhaps the wages of the individuals that are going to be working over there to the very bricks that they decide to use to build any sort of building on that property. You have every single right to be of everyone's butt <laughs> that's involved in making decisions on this on this development. So that I wanted to make these three things very clear so you're not so there's no sort of concern or wavering to action on this on this work after this panel. So I'm going to really quick share my screen um, and actually tell a little bit about what's happening here in Houston. Hopefully folks can see this. So I want to zoom in a little bit. Uh, this is a document that you can see if you typed in on your browser uh, on the upper left hand corner, you can see here uh, linktree dot uh, link tr.ee slash hcedd in case you ever want to learn anything about what we do we're very public and very transparent um but as you can see by this map uh right over in this per you see all these institutions right uh you're probably tuning in from zoom right now uh if no one's familiar with the landscape of houston this is what houston uh, looks like and if you zoom in very much closer to the center you see most of our educational higher educational institutions so right here in the purple, you see the innovation district, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking a lot about. And you see in that big circle is the greater third ward, which is the community I'm going to also be talking about, the historically black community, right? So I just want to give folks that context as I zoom out. So who's HSED, right? So we're a group of neighbors, uh, community leaders, scholars, students, and organizations from third ward and across Houston who are interested in getting a community benefits agreement with Rice Management Company um, as it develops the innovation district. What's the innovation district? It's a 16 acre, 16 acres is a lot, right? So it's a 16 acre development um, that is pretty much supposed to change or uh, divert uh, Houston's economy from an oil dependent economy to a tech economy, right? They're trying to build basically their uh, Silicon Bayou as, is, what they're, is what they're calling it, right? And what we know across the entire uh, United States of America is every single time this has happened, the story and the narrative is unfortunately the same, right? Gentrification, gentrification, gentrification. However, we know that that story, that narrative does not have to persist, right? We know that there are several things that we can do to uh, involve ourselves preventative measures, right? Uh, you know, to make sure that these things don't, uh, that we see in LA where uh, folks are living in their, uh, their trucks outside of the Facebook headquarters and, um, and the Google headquarters, these things don't have to happen, especially noting that even Houston's poverty rate is increasingly rising. And apparently we're one of the, uh, you know, worst uh, cities in regards to economic inclusion in, in the United States, right? So, these things don't take have to happen, right? Gentrification, right? The influx of people, resources, and different sorts of uh, uh, efforts to remove the people and different uh, cultural identities of an area, it doesn't have to happen. What's Rice Management Company? It's uh, basically the sugar mamas and sugar daddies of Rice University. They make sure that that $6.5 billion, billion dollar endowment that they sit on is increasing over time and is stable. So this is an investment opportunity for them, right? They are putting, they are going outside, as you see, they're going outside of their area for the first time historically as Rice University is a private institution and, and taking some land and building upon it for the first time. This is, this is a big moment for them, right? Well, what's a community benefits agreement? Ted has already talked about it, but I wanna really, really even simplify it down, right? It's a contract. Right, it's a contract between who? It's a contract normally between a community coalition and a developer. There are times you do see cities include themselves in certain aspects of the contract, but it's be between a community coalition and a developer. And you can again see all of this stuff if you search uh, linktr.ee/hcedd in, in your um, in your browser. Uh, the purpose of our CVA um, and and just to kind of wheel back a little bit. This is a huge coalition, right, of 30 different organizations. As you can see on the right-hand corner, right-hand side of your, uh, of your 
screen, you see faith-based organizations, education organizations, you see uh, advocacy organizations, you see labor organizations, right? Um, you see them all represented for folks who are from third, uh, organizations that are in third ward and organizations that are around third ward, all interested in building a, an innovation district that hits that and addresses the needs, concerns, and visions of people surrounding in the surrounding communities. So H said is not against this development. We're against the development as as planned, right? We're against we're against the process in which the developers have decided to go about deciding what's going to happen um, in the innovation district, right? What we always look at uh, in in our spaces, we don't see uh, even though it's very obvious, a community benefits agreements get to various outcomes. That's very cool and very important, right? Like it's 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 very beautiful to have this happen, you know, uh, when it does. But we really see community benefits agreements as process changing opportunities, right? There's this notion, there's this notion across the state of Texas, this yeehaw state we live in, that anyone can do anything they want as long as they have the money, right? And they don't have to ask anybody for permission. They don't have to talk to anybody. So we're interested long-term, the long-term outcome of our CBA is to just set a new precedent for how we even do development, right? In the, in the city and, uh, and across the state, because there's no reason there's no reason for UTSA, for example, to be doing all the things that it's doing without uh, first from the outset saying, hey, we're interested in having a contract with y'all. Not an MOU, right? Not a memorandum of understanding, but it, there's no reason for, for them knowing all the, the history that they've been involved in and knowing the, the climbing rates of poverty for them to not take you seriously and say, hey, we know that there's gonna be a lot of impact. So we wanna make a thing that we are tied to legally with you, right? And the fact that they haven't done that this entire time and apparently have said here and there that it's not possible is outright absolutely inappropriate, right? That's that's absolutely already red flag there, but they have a lot of op opportunity to, to, to come back. So I'm about opportunities. Our CBA is about seven different uh, areas. That's really wild. Uh, most CBAs across the country like focus on one, two, three areas, like right affordable housing and probably two other things because the housing is a really big thing. But the residents in Third Ward decided to do seven different big areas that are really crucial to the revitalization of the Third Ward area, right? Um, as you can see, you see several pictures of like pre-pandemic when we were, you know, out and about doing the thing. This this is an effort that's been taking place since November of 2019. So it's been a long time coming, and we're we're very very further into this work. Um, and this is a checklist to see how we've gone about our process. Uh, above is what the process that we're trying to that we're that we're you know focused on and how far we've gone to. So we formed our negotiation teams team and you know there's a lot of things that you're gonna that I can talk about in regards to what's happening in the press and the city's involvement and all sorts of different things but just know that it process is important right cutting deals on 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 the side and trying to have uh you know the this person's best friend speak for you or no like we're very transparent all of our meetings are public we've had developers and their pr people come in and sit in and say nothing right it's it really should be a transparent situation because it's very it's very fragile to co-optation it's very fragile to a uh let's say a director of development for the city coming in and saying hey we want to uh overtake this entire process and call us a community benefits agreement it's not a community benefits agreement right when that happens you have to say oh you're doing a developer contract okay we want a community benefits agreement <laughs> right we want to include we want to we want to put ourselves in a process in which uh we are represented not only in the the, the pre uh determining of what's going to happen in the development but the aftermath um if you didn't notice we are interested in developing securing enforcing and sustaining the, the agreement right what does it look like to have the building all up uh, if that's what y'all decide to do what's the what's the what's the you know after that happens what does it look like to have community 
over invo overly involved in the things that take place in that building on a regular basis outside of just classes or whatever research they're doing in that building, right? So um, again, I just wanted to give this preface. Um, here's some more stuff on CBAs. We have our history. We have all of our live streams and YouTube uh, links on here as well on our link tree. So in the case that you ever want to see how we go about our meetings, that's also very available to you. We are also, and here's our negotiation team, we also have that very clear. They were elected by the community members. Um, we are very fortunate to do this pre-pandemic, like literally a month before shutdowns. So, you know, that process was beautiful. And if you ever want to contact us, you can shoot us an email at hello at Houston CVA or, um, or you know, DM us on any social media platform. Um, I know I did. I didn't necessarily answer the question directly, but really, educational institutions are full of people, right? And these people are engaging themselves in certain practices, whether they're practices of inequality or equality, um, is up to you. And because UTSA is the public institution, then that means that they have to engage in practices that have to benefit you, right? Okay, so I want to give that to give it to Mary Claire now, um, a co-organizer. We're both co-organizers of this effort. Also, by the way, I'm a University of Houston um, a grad, so I'm not necessarily a Rice University student. We had several university students from across the city engage in this effort. So I really do encourage any student or young person who's involved in this to get involved. Thanks, Uyosa. Um, I'm so happy to seeing those pictures, and it feels like such a long time ago that all of this happened. Um, I was just going to speak a little bit about, um, mostly from my own experience as a student, because um, as you saw, Rice Management Company is the developer in Houston that we're trying to get the CBA with. And so their endowment is directly what supports my education. Like I, I'm there because they, you know, they have this scholarship program where middle class to low income students basically just get to go free. Anyway, um, so I think also sp speaking off of what um, Adriana talked about with how our education systems, um, gentrification comes into those education systems and affects how students learn and how students are connected to their communities. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about how my educational um, experience was transformed by working with um, with the community of Third Ward and kind of how that started because um, Rice University is very, it's very elitist, it's very closed off to the rest of the city and that's on purpose. And so any opportunities that students have that are built into our education is like volunteer opportunities, programmatic things, you know, go tutor these kids after school, anything where you are a vessel of the university or you're a vessel of an organization within the university. And so um, what, what, what's important to me about um, how I got involved with H said, one of the things that's important um, is me and other students just were curious. And we, we saw that, you know, Rice was announcing this development and we said, you know, we've been, we've been down the light rail. We know what it looks like. We know that that's where a lot of houses people live and we know right next to his third ward. And so we just started talking to each other and talked to maybe like a string of five different people who were like, talk to this person, talk to that person, They'll, they should know something. Um, finally, that led us to a community leader in third ward, um, Dr. Asada Richards, who's also a community researcher. Um, but all that to say, we were finally for once in, in our rice education. Um, talking to our neighbors as only neighbors, not as volunteers or part of an organization. Um, and I thought, and that completely changed the way that I started to learn and the way that my education started to form around those relationships that I was forming as a community member and positioning myself as a neighbor and not as, you know, a, a researcher or a volunteer of some sort. Um, and those community members were the, the way that they empowered us to say, you're, because you're here coming to us as neighbors, 
we consider you neighbors and we're going to give you that responsibility that you have as neighbors and we're going to entrust that to you. Um, and so that's what's kept me attached to this work for over a year now. And also what makes me want to stay in Houston and, and live here after I graduate. Um, but yeah, for any students watching or, or parents of students, um, it's, yeah, I, I just, or any, you know, any community members who know students, I encourage everyone to take that responsibility to each other as neighbors seriously. Thank you, Mary Claire, and thank you, Yosa. And so kind of bringing it back to San Antonio, um, I would like to ask very specifically, you know, um, what could, how could students and families on the west side, especially, and also on the east side of San Antonio, um, benefit from the redevelopment and expansion of the downtown of UTSA's downtown campus? Um, yeah, wow. Um, just first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be in community with you all. Um, I've already learned so much with these esteemed panelists who have so quickly elevated my mission as a public school servant. So I just, I wanna thank you all humbly for everything that you've shared with, with me um, that I can take back to my community. Um, so when I reflect on the history of development, very few times is it center pre-K through 12 voices or campus voices. Very few times do we ever acknowledge the living, breathing realities of our students and our teachers whom operate and uphold these spaces and critical communal relationships. Hardly ever do they become elevated consultant or at times even considered. Many times we're often left to just adapt, to persevere instead of be able to lead and to engage authentically. Um, I think the expansion of the university doesn't necessarily correlate with an expansion of our public school resources. I think Sophia, uh, gave us data to provide significant evidence for, for, for that comment. More space doesn't necessarily equal more equity and nor does it equal more opportunity for our youth unless we demand it. Our city is growing with investors and profits yet we still struggle to meet the virtual learning student needs, the medical and COVID response needs, the material financial needs of our students and of our communities. We still struggle to ensure that our students on the west side take up seats in those classrooms at UTSA, seats that were designed by them and seats that were fought for for them. Um, I think when thinking about housing instability, lack of voice and decision making, lack of control in our own lives, this becomes very stressful, not just for adults, but even more so for students for our youth who become infested with stress hormones and attacks on their nervous systems, during, especially during this formative development. Consequently, this makes any type of learning almost unattainable, which leads us to the distorted data of our students not um, achieving and not becoming able to, um, to bring together and to overcome the achievement gap. It's been said by many that we're never going to go back to normal. And it, this is our opportunity to create a new normal, a new more robust normal together. And a no more a normal that co creates agreements that benefit all people. A normal that truly leads the charge to racial equity. And I want to see our educational institutions a part of that conversation and a part of that charge. Because right now, it feels like this has the potential to be extremely one-sided where spaces will be taken, removed, even dismembered. And who will be left to fill those gaps, those open wounds? I don't believe that, uh, that these are developing our community, that th these programs, these projects are developing our community more than they're attempting to redefine our community. And I think we can all agree that there should be no narrative of our community, no narrative of our students of our barrio none should be constructed without us. This can lead to an identity crisis, urging our youth to abandon their traditions for the safety and, uh, and survival of the status quo. And in our classroom, we must let them lead. Our schools must prepare them for critical scholarship and praxis. Even if it means taking a leadership step forward and 
sharing with pedagogues that it is possible, sharing with them that we must let our heart and our mind lead us in this charge and not our fear of compulsory education, not our fear of retaliation. Uh, not incorporating youth results in shameful impacts that can alter the destinies of our youth. We've discussed about lies, about employment, transportation, shelter stability, and various exacerbations of the inequities that we currently daily overcome. And without youth, without a focus of those most impacted, who are we privileging? And who are we setting up to succeed? What sorts of destinies are we altering? To me, the 78207 is more than a zip code that one can live in. It's more than a zip code that you can create a promenade in to add to the surface level beauty of a campus. To me, living in the 78207 is a way of life, a lifestyle and a beauty that one walks in. So what happens to our students when we take that away? Um, I'm very proud of this, but I'm the Peace and Justice Center for bringing this together and for adorning our barrio with, with these beautiful messages of mi barrio no se vende. And I would like to add, y mi futuro no se vende tampoco. You can't, you can't buy my future, our future. Developers can try to buy and steal our land, but they cannot buy and steal our futures. They will not manifest the destinies of our students because it is theirs. And I believe that as teachers, as educational institutions, it's our duty to support students, discern between what is said and what is, or what it is, right? Um, in terms of roles and responsibilities and moves that we as educators must uh, or can employ, um, it centers around activism and engaging in activism within and outside of our classroom. It means balancing the role of classroom leader and community advocate and as hard as it may be because of our own collective traumatic memories in the education system, it means abandoning top-down decision-making, both on the campus level and in the decisions that are created in our very own classrooms. We have to consult with youth in regards of school policies, even classroom uh, procedures and expectations, course offerings, and all the interworkings of decisions that are made on campuses that ultimately impact the integrities of our communities. We must remind and reawake the voices, the power and the force that our students are, because I'm so fortunate. I know this isn't new because Lanier High School students organize and demanded better educational conditions. Students advocated for liberties, not just of their peers, but of adults as well. Students challenge unjust school, city, school and city policies. And right now, I think it's ever necessary that we continue this legacy explicitly, actively. And we must continue celebrating, affirming and widening our thinking and our students thinking and their being, preparing them for a future that they in this moment are already creating, a culture that they are already creating. It means working in power with students and not working with power over students. And really deconstructing what the word power even means in our school systems. I think this community benefits agreement this expansion project, um, that's hap it's, it's something that's happening now, right? So we can't wait until our students are in high school or we can't wait until our students are in a, in a senior seminar course, right? This critical thinking needs to happen yesterday, right? We need to focus on questions like who will be harmed by this expansion? Who will benefit? How can we make a positive change now? We must assiduously teach critical thinking to disrupt societal imposed notions of land, identity, opportunities, voice, poder. And I think that we can help students develop agency, you know, through critical practice, through research, in any content level. It doesn't have to be specific to ethnic studies courses, to uh, uh, speech courses, right? This can be embedded throughout. And I think moving forward with this agreement, I personally would like to see a multi-generational pipeline between residents of the community and UTSA. I don't want just my student to get a chance to go to UTSA. I want their mom to go to UTSA. I want their grandma to get a chance to go to UTSA, right? Because a more informed community is a more informed decision base. And I wanna suggest also a vested recruitment and mentorship program created by youth not by folks at the university. We want youth to create the programs that are meant to benefit them, to elevate their voice. 
Um, also, I hear from students that they really appreciate intentionalized outlets for creativity and mental health, especially during this uh, distance, this era of distance learning or even distance social interaction. Um, and I want to guarantee y'all, I want to guarantee to maintain the integrity of the communities in their homes, to honor their dignities of people of this land that has been continuously taken and robbed from our people. Our educational landscape is, is highly disproportionate. And I charge us to see the space for students to own a future city that they can critically seek to better, to maintain and to sustain really a, a, a city that not only chose them, but that they chose as well, that they created as well. Thank you so much, Adriana. Um, and that can kind of concludes our, thank you for closing us out in such a beautiful and powerful and righteous way. Um, we would like to open it up for questions. I know some questions have been put into the chat. Um, unfortunately, Sofia Lopez had to go to another appointment, um, but any questions that you would like to direct towards Sofia too, you can ask her directly or ask in the chat and we will make sure to, um, to answer them. So let's see. Also, just to let you know, um, where we are in San Antonio versus where we are in Houston are in very two different spaces. We are just beginning our organizing journey really in San Antonio in terms of at the point of like building our coalition where we are very rooted in the west side of San Antonio, but we need to uh, kind of expand to people, folks on the east side, uh, faith-based faith organizations, other nonprofits, uh, you know, that, that's a lot of work that where we are right now um, and we're going and we are committed to leading that work and really centering student voices going into um, going, going, you know, going into this new year. So the first question is, um, what role does the city have in a CBA process and implementation? So for any of our panelists. Either me or Ted is, is probably it, but uh, I'll probably take it real quick and then perhaps I'll also give it to Ted to see like well, what you've seen as well. Um, well, cities can come in, in, in in a couple of different ways, but you know, in this context, uh, the community benefits agreements take, play, take place between, the reason why this uh, reorganization of, of who's involved in developments to just between a city and a um, and the and the and the developer um, to the community and the developer and maybe the city is because normally folks uh, in the community are like audience members of a huge kind of like football game between the the city and the developers so to answer that question straightforward, cities can come in in different ways. There, there are probably aspects. They can come in during the negotiation process because perhaps two parties don't understand um, a certain thing that they both want. They can come in um, to solidify, let's say, something about like a tax abatement or something that involves the cities that the city must have to say yes to. Um, so it's normally in process that they come in. If, for example, that the city was giving money to the development, often the city would have to be there just, just because they're also giving money to the development as a public entity. But at the roots of it, normally it's between the developer and the community. There are real weird situations where the city is the developer, right? Where like the city is building the park. So they are the developer you're talking to. So that's when things get really interesting. But um, Ted, do you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I'll just I I agree. Um, yeah, with 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 what you just said, um, and uh, government officials come in throughout the process, and uh, you know there can often be some tension too, and that's not not you know we're talking in in the context of advocacy and in building power, so that's not always a bad thing, right? Um, and, and and certainly with respect to contestation, and um, there's it's about sharing power, and it's about you know community coalitions taking power too. So. Um, uh, you, you will um, experience 
um, the involvement of executive level agency folks, as well as legislative folks like city council. So, you know, it's important to engage those individuals who can be supportive and, and bring development, bring developers to the table um, in, in a way that hopefully is constructive to the CBA campaign. But it's, it's also important to work with uh, government to the extent that, you know, to, to extent that they can be allies. I'll just mention too, you know, we, we haven't talked about local ordinances. Uh, Detroit and some other cities have some CBA ordinances that are uh, in process right now. You know, developers often say, or local government folks will say, you know, I, I see you, Chicago and others are experimenting with this. Um, you know, we'll say like, look, I can't have a CBA because we'll stop development. And that's just garbage. It's just not true. The, the, there's problems with the Detroit uh, Community Benefit or Ordinance. And, uh, you know, it wasn't the one that the community members pushed for the sort of a watered down approach, but we're seeing, you know, that's a data point that we're looking at now. And it's something certainly to, to see uh, uh, to consider implementing in, you know, major cities across the country, including the ones we're talking about now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so a next question that we have is what specifically would you want to see in a CBA regarding the Alassane Apache court? So uh, recently, you know, we actually, um, the, this past week, the San Antonio Housing Authority just announced that, we, you know, like a day or two ago that they are canceling their contract with their developer NRP, um, who um, Sofia talked about earlier. Um, they will not, and they are not going to be demolishing the Alaskan Apache courts. Um, I think specifically with our work around tenant organizing um, throughout, you know, public housing in San Antonio and specifically around Alaskan Apache courts, I would, we, I could kind of talk, have some conversations with um, Kayla Miranda, who is uh, Esperanza's lead housing organizer about what does the inclusion of Alassan residents um, in that process of negotiation how look like? How can we center them? I mean, really, we, we have some ideas, but we really want, in, in respecting um, centering the tenants, we want to hear it from them. So, like, as we know, very few West Side students, students from West Side high schools, um, are enrolled in UTSA or are have been retained at UTSA, and especially, most specifically, for linear students, which is in our historic West Side Resident Association. So we definitely have in mind around or continuing organizing around Alasan and organizing with tenants um, that we want to include them in the CBA process and kind of really get feedback from them about what that looks like. Um, the next question, and I don't know if anybody else had something to say around that. Um, the next question, can you say a little about next steps as far as forming a coalition in San Antonio on the scale of HCED, what, what it might look like and how can we help? Um, I think as you have seen with HCEDD, they, they have a very broad coalition um, that includes many players. Um, I think we're at the point that we cannot make an excuse anymore about living in a virtual world. Uh, we have to really, many of us already in the community have those contacts with different entities. And so we have to just actively reach out to them and build that coalition. I think also um, it might be in the works to do kind of a community campaign. Um, how can you help? If you are interested, please joining us. Join us. We have we meet. We've been meeting about every two weeks. Um, we in in order to facilitate the inclusion of students, we will probably have to change the time and date of our meetings to meet, be more community based. And so we will be sending out information about those meetings publicly, so that anyone who is interested in joining us um, can do so. I would also. Could I add something as well, Judith? Yes, please. Um, so I. Um, I would encourage you all. There are so many different ways you can you can move next. I do. I don't want H said to look like uh, the success model because there are a lot of models, right? So like there are a lot of models with a lot of different um, sizes of coalitions. The reason why ours is so large is because this is a development that is being proposed to help the entire right, the entire city. So we need so many different folks from inside their ward and around um, the city. 
But what I would encourage you to do is to get a lot of young people involved for many reasons. Um, not only the really much younger folks under the age of 18, just because this is literally a thing that they're gonna be like, this is their place, right? This is their area, but also current students at the University of Texas uh, at San Antonio, because whether they're from San Antonio or not, right? Most of the most of the Rice students who are involved in this are not from Houston. And, and it, it just so happens that most of the Rice students who are from Houston or even from the Third Ward who are at Rice don't have really the time because they're so, they're really trying to do their best. Um, so it doesn't matter who from UTSA, as far as a student does this work, it does a lot of the energy work. Um, it just matters that they show up and they, and they you know, show solidarity um, through the work. A lot of the students in our, our coalition do the grunt work, whether it be handling the Zoom chat, whether it be handling emails, whether it be, um, you know, typing during meetings, right, which is a big deal, whether it be sharing their screen during, like all the very small things so, so community members can just show up right and do what they want to do right so get a lot of young people involved and um, mary claire and i are always a resource um to you all on figuring out how to do that most effectively uh, thank you Yosa. and um yes and actually i want to correct myself i said something correctly and um I, it was brought up in the chat so the demolition with alasana pachi courts has not been halted i mean has not been canceled it's just been their um, their agreement with the developer uh, was was canceled, and they are going to redevelop themselves. So it, I guess it's been stalled a bit, um, and they have agreed to keep to maintain the level of public housing there. And so, um, question: the next question, which is the organization that has been meeting every two weeks? And so um, we have a a small work group that was started back in. I would say April or May, and it is a work group of the Mi Barrio No Se Vende Coalition, um, which is a coalition that Esperanza is part of and the Neighborhood Association. And this is a subcommittee of that, of that group. The Mi Barrio No Se Vende Coalition has kind of really been on hiatus because of, we were trying to align around a lot of um, tenant organizing and housing justice work that was being done across several organizations. And so we will, if we get a lot of response in terms of people who want to get involved, I mean, we can like kind of relook at that and make it very publicly available of when we're meeting um, during a time when community members are available. And the next question is, does HCEDD have funding from any source? That's so exciting. What a question. No, we have a cash app. Um, we are not an incorporated organization. And we have actually, um, how do I say this? We have approached uh, a major development funding nonprofit organization in Houston, and um, they did not show their support um, because they just don't, they're not interested in taking the leap that is necessary. So you're gonna find a lot of people who say no, <laughs> just because they are used to the plantation state that we're in, okay? So we have a cash app, uh, dollar sign HCEDD if you're interested, but we're probably gonna give it to Esperanza if, we, if you give it to us. Um, and yeah, that's what runs our email. That's what runs our live stream. All the, uh, over probably 20 uh, young people have been involved in this work over time and no one has been paid, right? Like I, I technically do more work on H, well, at a time I was doing more work in H than I was doing my actual day job, right? So no, we just grunt and we just make it happen. We pull resources, resources from other people and other people are contributing to this as we need. Um, we will be incorporated uh, or may not, I don't know what the community decides, right? I can't speak for them. Um, but as a result of making the CBA, but no, we do not get in, uh, we're all grassroots people give to the uh, cash app. Don't tell the IRS though. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's not that big of a deal. I think I, ha I didn't, we didn't address another question kind of that was um, coupled with the earlier question was what could a CBA with UTSA here um, with our community look like? And um, 
I think we've kind of, like I said, we've struggled with outreach um, because we know that the communities that we are trying to reach out with, like there's there's the digital divide. Um, you know, how do we how do we do effective outreach during the pandemic? Um, so I think that we know, I mean, a lot of us who work in community, we already know kind of the, it, what we would like, you know, educational equity, food insecurity is an issue, affordable housing, um, healthcare. So, but, but we really don't feel comfortable that we've gotten enough community engagement um, for, to kind of have like a list of asks yet. Okay. Um, so if that, if there are no more questions, just if you would like uh, to stay involved, um, please follow us on Esperanza. We're gonna start kind of sharing more information about our process and um, what, what we're doing in our, our, meeting, our meetings. And as well, I think Natalie has shared in the chat um, an email if you're interested in continuing this work and continuing this conversation. So in closing, would anybody else like to add anything before we before we end? We'd just like to thank all of our panelists and thank you Esperanza for holding this space for us. Just follow us on social media, also UTSA um, Mexico Center, which Jerry Gonzalez runs, has also been a kind of a co-sponsor of a lot of our, our virtual work around this. Um, and so thank you very much for joining us. Have a good day. Be safe.